Good evening, everybody. My name's Sophie Lieberman, and I'm Head of Public Programs here at ACME, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's session on art, science and tech in VR. As we begin this evening, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on Aboriginal land. Um, oh, pardon me. And I should make sure that I have my notes in the right order. I'll staple differently next week. Um, and that as we discuss art, technology and science, it's important to acknowledge that we meet on lands of the oldest living culture in the world, a culture that's been innovating, creating new technologies for survival and enjoyment, and also in the pursuit of knowing the world for millennia. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and to the elders of other communities who may be here today. My task is a short one, which is merely um, to welcome you and to introduce our speaker this evening. Last week we explored the personal and the political aspect of trolling, and next week we'll focus on retro nostalgia on the small screen. But tonight we're here asking the question, what are the possibilities when art, science and technology intersect? And specifically, how is virtual reality expanding and creating new ways of understanding the world? ACME has a long record of experimenting in VR through our commissions, our public programs, the VR lounge down in Screen Worlds, and also um, through the residents in our ACME X co-working space. The genesis for this conversation um, was over kind of one week of three different, very, very different relationships. Um, we were talking about the commissioning of Earth for the prehistoric aquarium. We were also talking with an ACME X resident, resident called Vertov, who were working with Vernon R. Key on a residency to embody his drawings of country. And finally, um, I visited Swinburne, where I heard the professor, um, talking about the use of VR around a science literacy program. So we were delighted to be able to bring these ideas together, add new elements, and present them to you this evening. The final thing um, that I need to do is to acknowledge and thank Angrid, um, Astrid Scott um, for assisting us in chairing this evening. So Astrid is a senior producer for the ABC's research and development team, R&D explore and demonstrate emerging audience behaviours and technology opportunities to help envision a future ABC media experiences. As a digital producer and content strategist, she's produced some award-winning content experiments for the ABC and many prototypes, including the ABC's early experiments with VR. In addition, Astrid has been a public interactive exhibition and events producer, digital content manager, and also has her own art practice. I think you will agree with me that she is the perfect facilitator for this evening's um, conversation. Astrid, welcome. Thank you, Sophie. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so this evening we're going to have a discussion with three professional storytellers. Each is a celebrated expert in their own field who has tried to extend what is possible with their craft by embracing emerging technologies. Tonight, of course, we're focusing on their experience with immersive storytelling in the medium of virtual reality. Now, I'm sure that many of you, like me, are familiar with the roller coaster of expectations that VR has been riding uh, since the first Oculus came out in 2013. The, site, the hype cycle can be very, very unkind, and tonight is not going to be about is it a thing, is it not a thing. Instead, we're going to talk about the potential, and we're going to talk about the potential of immersive storytelling for communicating something new, for expanding our horizons, and what it's like to try and do that as an artist or an educator. We'll have a presentation from each of our guests that's going to introduce you briefly to their work and experience, and then a discussion including some other examples of VR, which is trying to do exactly that, expand our horizons. So first of all, I'd like to say that uh, Scott Wright's award-winning theatre company Earth has been inspiring people by immersing them in paleontology as performance for decades. He's taken a dinosaur zoo to Broadway, and now he's installed a prehistoric aquarium downstairs. He's quoted as saying, puppets are the new black. But rather than quoting old interviews, I'll let him speak for himself. Please welcome Scott Wright. So um, despite the fact that I look like the oldest person in the room, um, I'm very, very new to VR. Um, probably the most naive of anyone sitting on this panel. Um, I work, I work with a company that um, kind of revels in doing things differently to everyone else and a company that embraces um, beautiful accidents 
and our current show, which is um, Earth's Prehistoric Aquarium, um, prior, prior to the show starting, um, two of the puppeteers go out into the foyer and collect six children and bring them backstage and then induct them into uh, safe diving practices such as breathing techniques. They put a diving suit on and diving helmets. And uh, so 15 minutes before the show starts, we get six members of the cast that didn't know they were going to be in the show to start with. And then uh, halfway through the show, those six kids are then brought up on stage and then they become kind of like the, the avatars of the audience. They, they experience this, uh, this unique underwater space and they kind of navigate that space with um, the, one of the hosts of the show. It's a great show. And I, I totally recommend that you should see it at the um, <laughs> Melbourne Art Centre in September next year. But um, we were doing the show at Adelaide Festival earlier the, uh, last year, five star rating. And um, <laughs> Katrina Cedric, who is the director of ACME, and I were in the artist's bar having a few drinks. And um, Katrina said to me, if you were going to make a VR, Scott, what would you do? And as is my charm, I said I would either make a horror film where nothing happened or I would make a six-minute version of Prehistoric Aquarium. And uh, Katrina thought that was a good idea. And so having never made a film, let alone a VR, I found myself with a commission and um, very quickly it kind of escalated and we managed to secure some funding from uh, Screen New South Wales. We um, got a massive amount of in-kind support from Australian Film and Television School and we also um, worked with um, Start VR, who are kind of like a, a corporate VR company in Sydney. But all throughout that whole time of sort of like pulling our resources together, um, I continued to sort of say that I, I, I had no interest in, in, in what anybody else was doing in VR. And in fact, I tried to avoid as much uh, a kind of, I don't know, I tried to avoid VR as much as possible so that I didn't get bogged down by what everybody told me you couldn't do. And, uh, we shot it in February this year. We had three days in the studio. The thing that I hated the most about it was that we were doing it in the Australian Film and Television School. Not that that's a bad thing, but it meant that we were doing something that had all this baggage that was related back to film and television. And VR, even by my limited experience, is definitely not a film space. It's a theatre space and it needs to be treated that way and I found the most frustrating thing in what we were trying to achieve in the studio was that um, there was just too many people who had statuses that needed to be sort of made, we, I needed to be made aware of. We just couldn't work fast enough. The lighting guy needed to make sure I knew he was the lighting guy and, um, and also because we were using an, an Ozo, which is sort of like a top of the range VR camera. It sort of looks like one of the Sentinels from Matrix. It has, it's like a, a small grapefruit with eight cameras. It has two stereoscopic cameras at the front, which gives you 3D. And, um, and the problem with, with that is that it takes 36 hours to render down everything that you shoot. So you can't look back at what you've done. And so we were kind of just having to sort of just punch it out as, far, as much as we could with the kind of, I won't say limited sort of um, enthusiasm of the crew, but um, it didn't give you much room to sort of uh, learn from your mistakes. You just sort of had to do as much as you could as you, in the time that you had and then hope to God three weeks later, once everything had been rendered and stitched, that you had something that, could, that was worth showing. And fortunately, um, a lot of the, the um, 
the post-production was done voluntarily by um, the staff or people from AFTAs. So I do owe a lot to, to the generosity of other people. And, but it also meant that it, there was a very long period of time in, in which we could um, produce the product. And it sounds like such an ugly word, using the word product, but um, there was a lot, of, a lot of playing around and, and still I felt like it was, we were bogged down because everybody was kind of using this sort of idea that we were making a film or we were making a movie or mm. something. And um, these are the, um, in pre these are the kids that's, oh. <laughs> I just wanted to tell you, Stella and Bella, the girl that welcomes you into the tank, and then Bella at the end who yeah. tells you that she's, we're going to the Great Barrier Reef. We've, we're, we're thinking of enlisting them to make a, a VR about them talking about their bedrooms because they're so enthusiastic and they're such great little girls. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think the other thing about what we've done in, this, in, in the VR space is that We've used real time, like we've used puppetry and as far as I know, no one else has done this yet. Um, I know that people are playing with puppetry, but no, no one's ever done anything on this scale yet. And the thing that I like about it is that, um, you know, puppetry really relies on the suspension of disbelief. It really, you know, it tricks your brain, it tricks your mind into um, believing that a completely inanimate object is alive. And, and then when you combine that with VR, which in turn is, is tricking the mind into believing that it's somewhere that it's not, you're kind of double tricking the brain at the same time. And I, I quite like the idea of sitting in that, that space and exploring that further. So how much can, can we potentially push that um, I think that um, the lessons learnt from prehistoric VR is that um, for the next little while, what, what we, and when I say we, I mean Earth, what we're going to do is um, kind of just try and find a better way of making things really fast. That um, Don't get bogged down with computers and um, programming and lighting guys and all that sort of stuff, but actually just sort of play with the idea of taking off-the-shelf equipment like um, the, the new Samsung Gear 360, which is like a, a two-lens camera, like a size of a golf ball that sits on an egg cup, and stick it on a table and basically make cardboard cut little miniature cardboard cutouts of everything and just sort of make stuff. Yeah. You know, and play with, play with everything, but not have to be not, not have to be delayed by anything. I feel like um, you kind of have to because VR is such a new space. It's you just have to sort of throw yourself in. It's like climbing up to the top of the tree as far as you possibly get, can, and just seeing how much further you can go before it breaks and you fall. And I I, f I feel like that's where I want to go with it. I want to find out how long I can sit underwater for without having to come up for a breath or, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a space that is unknown and therefore th th it's dangerous and, and, and that's what excites me and I, I don't think, the more people tell me that you can't do stuff, the more I'm determined to do it, so... Uh, is that 10 minutes? I reckon that will do. Yeah. Okay, we, we're going to pick up on some of these things. So. <laughs> That's got <quite sweet>, yeah. <laughs> to we'll, we'll definitely be coming back to some of those points that you raised, Scott. So last year, Jesse Hughes was named one of Australia's future changes. That's just a, a tiny brief for her there. But I think you'll all agree that she's up to it. As well as being a passionate advocate for digital innovation as a positive social influence, she's also a very accomplished artist. Her virtual reality and new media works have been exhibited at Khan, South by Southwest, Sundance and the Tate Gallery in London. Last year, and she's quite busy obviously, she won the very prestigious Tech Art, Arti Tech Nart 
artist residency. Is that how you say it? It's like Spanish, Span Tecnate. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Tecnate. I don't know. I can't speak Spanish. Artist <laughs> residency, which formed the basis of her latest work. Here to tell you about it, please welcome Jessie Hughes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I suppose a bit of like the problem is that I love everything so much that I haven't been able to like nail down exactly what I want to do. Um, and so just given the topic of tonight was art, science and tech, I tried to just pick two projects which I think relate strongest to this theme tonight. Um, so I, I'll start with my artist residency. Um, so last year I stumbled across a brief asking how we can merge art, science and technology together. Um, and these are typically quite different worlds, um, but I think it's incredible if we can tie them together. Um, the, so this artist residency was at Roque de las Muchachas um, Astronomical Observatory over in Spain in the Canary Islands. Um, and when I researched them, I found out they had the most um, highly resolving solar telescopes in the world. So we had a bit of jealousy over here from an actual physicist. And yeah, and so I found out this fact and I was like, okay, well, obviously we have to do something about the sun. Um, that's what we need to be nailing down. Um, and now this footage is by NASA. It's incredible. Um, so what they did, do you know much background about this? Probably better explained by you. Um, yeah, yeah. So I did it. So Soho, it's a beautiful telescope um, that's floating out in the world, and not in the world, past the world. Um, and it, they recorded the sun moving in all these different wavelengths. And you're able to see, it, to me, it looked like it was alive. I just saw this isolated, alone ball of energy um, all by itself, and yet the reason we have life on Earth is because of the sun. Um, and so that was kind of what inspired me to, okay, how, how can we bring these emotions, these human emotions of empathy and appreciation and a connection between huma humanity and, you know, the thing that gives us life on this Earth, how can we tie that together? And that was through art, science and tech all coming in one little bundle. Um, so that resulted in my project Soul of Soul. Um, and... Yes, there's a little pun there, of course. Um, and, so, <laughs> um, and so I wanted to capture the spirit of the sun, and I did that using data. So if we look at um, when, when you study stars, they have like, um, like their own spectrum of, of what makes... Oh, this, sorry, this is during my residency um, there. They had like... I think it was 12, maybe even 13 or 14, yeah, yeah of like the world's best telescopes, um, which was beautiful. Yeah, and so I just wanted to really think, okay, how can we take data which to the general public um, is scary or boring or, you know, why does a thousand numbers on a page have any interest to anyone? How can we make that something that someone can look at and be like, oh, yeah, I do feel something? Um, and so what with this data, I visualised it in a way that I was able to build an actual structural form um, and so the spectral is kind of like the, the fingerprint of a sun. Um, each star has its own, you know, spectra of information that defines what it's made of or how old it is and all these factors which typically we associate to a person. Um, we could take all these characteristics and how I could put that into a, like a, a way that someone could empathise with. Um, the other element of what I loved, during my residency, I was exposed to this incredible audio file of the sun's heartbeat. Um, and so how it had been recorded was um, using this, this data from this telescope, um, the, this, the sun, it's, it's constantly shaking. It's constantly like boiling. If you imagine like a pot of water uh, like boiling, um, it's constantly shaking. And so what these uh, physicists had done was captured these wavelengths and brought it up to um, the audible hearing range, and it was this beautiful pulsating sound, which to me, as an artist, I was like, oh, I'm using this for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so it had like, this, this really beautiful uh, sound to it. Um, and I then did a data visualisation of this, of this audio and how we could you know, see and feel this heartbeat. So I had this whole element of the fingerprint of the sun, its heartbeat, um, and then, of course, it was solar-powered. Um, and so it had the solar power, like, triggering the whole installation. Um, 
yeah, and so it was, it was just this, I spent a month living at this observatory, which my astrophysicist partner was very jealous of. I was like, sorry, <laughs> stole your dream. Oops. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, it was just, it was a crazy awesome time. And it was, I was really excited to push um, how we are able to merge these different worlds together um, with just a bit of, you know, programming or creative, just creative thinking and how we can bring these worlds together, which I think... Um, the reason the, um, the observatory wanted to do it was because they had these amazing discoveries, which were, you know, the most forward-thinking humanity had ever gotten to. We're going past and beyond and beyond and beyond. And predominantly, unless you've read, like, a few research papers, you have no idea about it. The general public have no idea. And why would we? It's not accessible and it's not interesting looking at a giant data set. So it's this whole idea of how we can, we can make it interesting or beautiful or relatable um, and so that was that project in a nutshell, which was awesome. Um, and so then once I, when I finished that, I came back to Australia and um, I was selected for Oculus's VR for Good program um, over in the States. So my background is in interactive visual design, art, that kind of thing. I hadn't really done film or VR, that stuff beforehand. Um, and yet I just kind of ended up in this field. Um, and last year I was at Facebook headquarters and I'm sitting in a room and we were dropping names before, but like the, 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 the names of VR were all in the room. Everyone was in the room. They get up with the microphone like, thanks for being here, everyone, it's great. Um, so just a heads up, we don't really know what we're doing either. Um, so it's all good. Um, and so it was just crazy to have these people who in the industry are considered, you know, the best of the best. And they're like, you know, it's such an experimental space right now. Um, we're going to tell you the best practices. That's all we know is the best practices. Um, we're still trying to figure out what is the, the best of the best way to go. Um, so, oops, so this is my form of Morde Abuela. So how VR for Good worked was Oculus paired 10 filmmakers with 10 not-for-profits um, to make these really impactful, immersive um, stories. So I also have a background in the social good sector in fundraising. And I'd done face-to-face -face fundraising for years. And trying to be on a street, trying to convince somebody to care about something is really hard because they have to imagine it. They have to be like, yeah, I suppose living without electricity would suck. And you're like, okay, but like, wh why would it suck? Like, well, what is the real reason? Like, what, wh where's the struggle? What's the oppression you're going through? Um, and so with VR, we can physically take somebody and place them in that exact experience. My first um, VR experience was at, uh, it was in like a shopping center over in the States. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Tom's before. So Tom's is an awesome shoe company. Um, if you buy a pair of shoes, they give a pair of shoes to a kid in need. Um, and they work predominantly in like South America, I think, but I think they've expanded, they've become massive. Um, yeah, so I was just like shopping, strolling around, I saw one of these sitting there, I thought, oh, check this out, put it on, and I, <laughs> I was bawling in a shopping center, and I just had tears falling down my face. I was watching a child get his first pair of shoes, and I'm in a, a school, I'm in a village in Peru, I think it was, and just this, this child was, like, they were just so happy they got the first pair of shoes, and the fact that I got to experience this child's, like, what was happening in his life, and just the gratitude, like, the, just, just the, the experience, the impact that, that Tom's had created for this child, I took that headset off and I was like, you know what, what can I do to help? Like, how, how, can, I, how can I be part of this? Um, and so coming from that fundraising background, I was like, this is going to be something big. Like, this, this has to be something big. Um, and which we've seen over the past few years is that using VR as a fundraising tool has been phenomenal because it allows people to stand in that shoe and to deal with it themselves and to see it and to see how their dollars can genuinely make an impact in people's lives. Um, yeah, so for VR for Good, I partnered with the Global Bright Light Foundation. This is at Facebook headquarters, best day of my life. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is on shoot in Guatemala. This is the Nokia Ozo we were talking about before. It's like a puffer fish, it like keeps my eyes, it's adorable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so this is in the school that I was filming in. Uh, so my story followed, it says director Jesse Yena Hughes. They used to tease me because I'm an Australian accent with an American crew. I was like, yeah, nah, yeah, nah, don't worry about it. Like, yeah, yeah nah, don't worry about it. I'm like, what do you want me to do? <laughs> 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 
Um, yeah, so my, my story followed um, the life of Anderson and Arelli. Um, so Anderson's family have, and this is, this is a true story, so um, Anderson's family have access to solar light, um, Arelli doesn't. Both absolutely beautiful kids, both super intelligent, have heaps of potential. Um, but, you know, Arelli doesn't have access to solar light, which means when the sun goes down, that's the end of the day for her. That means no studying after dark. Um, her parents aren't able, you know, as soon as the sun goes down, that's the end of the money. They're making like a dollar, two dollars a day for working in the fields their entire life. And then the sun goes down and that's super hard to connect with family members. You know, think when the sun sets, we get together with our family, we eat dinner, we watch TV. Um, but life really stops. And... For, for communities that are making, you know, barely any money as it is, productivity is massive, economy is massive, so buying candles. These families are spending 25% of their income on candles, when in, it's one, like 2.5 for a typical US family. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was just, what we wanted to do with this film was not show, you know, white Americans coming in, dropping off some solar lights and leaving. Um, it, it, was, it was about, with this film, we wanted to show what, can, what is life really like for these kids? And how does solar light genuinely impact somebody's life? Um, and so really getting that like why story across. And that's what I found with the VR to be so, um, such an incredible experience was that you, it's narrated by the grandmother on the left. Um, so she tells the story about how, you know, she's so grateful that her son, she didn't have this opportunity, but now her son has this opportunity, her grandson has this opportunity of solar light and how it's impacted her life. Um, and as a viewer, to be able to be in a headset and hear the voice of a loving grandmother tell you about how she's so grateful that her child now has the potential to grow up and be someone, but, you know, his best friend doesn't, but if you help, he does. Like, it, it, was, it, was, just, it was just so, um, yeah, a really, really impactful process and making it was so much fun. Um, yeah, the whole 360 shoot, um, you can't be in the shot, so it's kind of like set up a camera and... <laughs> hope for the best, <laughs> and out you get. And it's like, that's what we were doing in the shoots. We have shoots in like fields where people are working in the fields and we're hiding in the grass, like lying down. And I'm like, everybody get, get down. <laughs> Lower. Um, yeah, so it was such a, such a fun um, experience to actually make and film. Um, I forgot to add to the end of the thing. I've been working like really strongly in this space for the past like year and a half. So I, other things I've done um, recently was I went over to Borneo and did 360 of like the orangutans over there, and that was so much fun. Again, I fell out of a canoe and broke my camera, but <laughs> don't have to talk about that either. Um, and the other area of what I'm working in at the moment is an experimentation of how we can teach people sign language in virtual reality. Um, we're in an awesome space right now with hand tracking technologies using a thing called Elite Motion. Um, and so what, I've, what I'm playing with is how if we have a headset, we put a tracker on, a person can go in and physically, you know, inhabit the body, see the hands moving below them. Um, and just, yeah, it's just an entirely different learning experience. The reason I wanted to do, like, merge these two worlds was to make learning sign language something super fun and super cool um, and to chuck on a headset and be so immersed in this that when they take it off, they're like, oh, my God, sign language is so much fun and cool. Like, let's go out and learn it. Um, and so that's, like, the kind of what we're trying to get across. And... Uh, it, we're still developing it. It's really hard to like track hands super accurately when you've got like three dimensions and stuff. But um, yeah, so it's, it, I think this space that I'm so grateful that I was like slingshot right to the top of it. And now I'm like, okay, let's, what else can we figure out? Um, but yeah, super fun and. I love it, and I encourage everyone, if it is an area of something that interests you, Samsung Gears are like, I think they're just even 200, maybe 300 bucks. Um, 220. Two, <laughs> deal, bargain, guys. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and like, I mean, I worked with the Nokia Ozo and Facebook, and like, that camera was worth 40,000 US dollars. Um, we had to carry a generator around the whole time because there was no electricity. Like, every single shoot took hours, and hours. it was just so hard. Mm -hmm. I took the Samsung Gear 360 to Borneo, chucked on a stick, <laughs> off we go. And honestly, like, yes, the quality is better with the Ozo, but if you're trying to make stuff, just go out and make it. And like, the, I, I use the gear professionally still. It's a, what, a 200 dollars camera, and I use it for universities, like professional clients, because it, it works just as well. Um, so yeah, I really recommend if you are interested, just go out and play with it. Um, if you are more into like the hard coding VR stuff with Unity and tech, there's so much cool learning out there at the moment. Um, and yeah, I definitely recommend anyone to jump on into it. <laughs> just <laughs> Thanks, yeah. <Jessie. laughs> Can you tell that I'm a tutor, right? Like, you <laughs>
Yeah, I was going to ask it. Were they moon boots that you were wearing on the? Um, uh, they were like really big uh, boots. So there's actually boots. a story behind that. So I was I was at Facebook and I, I I found out I like won this VR thing. Had no details, and I walked in. They're like, oh, here's your not for profit. I'm like, oh, you do that cool. And he was like. So you're making a movie for us, right? Mm. I'm sitting here being like, I've never made a movie in my life. I'm like, am I making a movie for you? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, like, okay, cool. Um, and I was like, oh my God. And he said he worked in Guatemala. I was like, oh, that's sick. I wish I could come, ha ha. And he's like, oh, I'm going next week. Do you want to come? Mm. Yeah, yeah, I'll come. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, sick. And I had no clothes because I was, you know, mm. packed to dress all pretty and like show off in San Francisco. And I actually bought those shoes Aww. from an op shop and they were two sizes too big for me, but they were the only ones they had. And I had a day to buy it and get my flute, my <laughs> needles and everything sorted the same day. So okay. there's the story behind the all shoes. Right. <laughs> not moon boots, just They're fashion. They're not my choice. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Jesse. Um, all right, um, Associate Professor Alan Duffy is an astrophysicist whose main interests, according to his bio, are making baby universes on supercomputers and vast halos of invisible dark matter. We're very lucky he doesn't mind explaining science to the rest of us on television as well. So here in his role of science communicator, please welcome Alan. Thank you. All right, so over the next few minutes, I really want to share with you uh, my effort to tell virtual stories, and in particular, that was to teach in, a, in a, what I hoped would be a different way. Uh, it wasn't. So instead, it's going to be about the lessons that I learned from not particularly telling stories in a different way, okay? It uh, all began with an idea that I had uh, again, I, I think there's been like a running theme of like those ideas just coming together, right people, right place, maybe alcohol involved, I don't know. <laughs> and it was the recognition that a lot of my science lectures by definition had to be in a lecture theater. And I was seeing the same people. And that's fine. That's great. They're my students and that's, that's, they should be there. But I was also in the evening lectures. It would be the same sort of crowd too. So I wondered with my colleagues, if we could free ourselves from the lecture theater and take the science to where the public were, would we get a different audience? Could we teach the science in a different way? And really, we sort of not like, what actually did we need from the lecture theater? And, and fundamentally, it was just about having a high definition image or a video. And we've seen some of the, the beautiful examples from SOHO and the, the Solar Dynamics Observatory. I mean, absolutely stunning stunning uh, content. So we decided to apply for a National Science Week grant and to my horror we got it because I had to deliver on this and when I say I, uh, I actually mean um, Carl Knox and Mark Myers from, from the OSGRAV, the Centre of Excellence for Gravitational Wave Discovery, they had to deliver on this and what they ended up delivering was um, Science in VR, right? So Cyber is an app that you can download from um, App Store or Google Play and you get this nifty little headset for like 20 bucks from, from our uh, uni store these days. But you can use any Google headset. And fundamentally, it was about making an app that was free and making a headset that cost less than even the 220, five bucks for a Google headset. This is a little bit flasher, right? It's like a little bit of gold. <laughs> I like bling, as you might, as you might tell. I like to dress up. And I want my headsets to like color match. So we had this idea that if we could create an app that featured the science, that we could do a science lesson differently. So we partnered with the State Library of Victoria and Mountain Goat Brewery, and I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be able to catch two different audiences. I, I don't think the Venn diagram is, is totally overlapping in that group. So with the app, you get to explore the sort of classics of Saturn, the solar system. You get to explore these super extreme objects called neutron stars. These are the very um, sort of cutting edge of, of astronomy. And uh, indeed, you can see the entire night sky in different wavelengths of light. And this is the Milky Way seen in uh, H1. So this is a giant radio telescope, it's like the Parkes radio telescope, the DISH. In fact, this is using some of that data. And it reveals a universe that is very different to the one that we experience in our daily lives. And 
that was exciting for me to see and I hope that it might be exciting for an audience as well. And look, we were in a bit of a hurry, so we just use a lot of text. I recognize that the voiceover is way better, right? Oh, so text. <laughs> text is brutal. If you're in the universe, I got so carried away with the science lesson. Fully half of the universe is text. <laughs> like you look around, it's like more facts. So yeah, I got very carried away with the science aspect of it, but I probably should have left it a bit more with the user experience. And what we wanted to do was in a live event, go somewhere distinct from a lecture theater to a science talk. But we wanted to cater for anyone who couldn't get there too. Because if people had the visuals that were on the app, they didn't really need to be at the lecture. They didn't need to be in the Mountain Goat Brewery or the State Library of Victoria. They could watch a live stream. And just in case they downloaded the app before the live stream commenced, as we have here tonight, I gave them a load of facts too. Awkwardly, I got some facts wrong, and people in the audience could read the fact, and we're like, uh, excuse me, it's actually 200 Kelvin, not 400. And I was like, oh, how embarrassing. So I, at least from that, and then I was like, of course. Aha, just testing. Good that you're all checking your facts. So that was the idea. Um, and it worked in the sense that we got new audiences. So this is at the Mountain Goat Brewery. Um, we managed to get... Um, 80% entirely new audiences to National Science Week, which is pretty good. And I think National Science Week is pretty happy with this. I don't know because I forgot to do the paperwork <laughs> to submit to them, and that's, that's on my list. Four and five of our attendees were new to National Science Week, which is particularly astounding because 99% plus were very or somewhat interested in science. So this is the, this is the group that National Science Week wants to target. And Four Fifths had never gone to a single event before, but something about the virtual reality spoke to them. It was a new way to tell an old story, and it resonated. Was it going to the new environment? Was it the new technology? It, in the post surveys, it turns out it is a bit of both. So that was pretty encouraging. So that was one of my lessons. You can reach a new audience with a new technology but you have to do something new too. The app isn't enough. What surprised me was the age group who arrived. We really did get a, sp a, a clean mix between um, the, uh, I'll just say above middle age, I don't want to be rude, the slightly older audience and, um, and younger sort of hipsters and, and there were people with turtlenecks. I just want to, that's actually my friend by the way. Um, so, Again, new audiences, but a range of audiences. It wasn't just the younger group. Everyone wanted to experience something different with this new technology. And that was very encouraging, it was very exciting. Now, what I wasn't expecting, however, and this, was, uh, this is the shot from State Library of Victoria, and this was a live event with my co-host, Dr. Katie Mack, who sadly just left Australia for a professorship in America, so fair enough. Um, if, you, if you're on Twitter, Hands up, who's on Twitter? Do you follow Astro Katie? Not yet, all right, okay. <laughs> like half the world follows her, she's amazing. Anyways, um, so the two of us tried this live talk and we find a surprising barrier where this is a phone app and it's with a cardboard headset. There is literally no way to make VR more user-friendly or simple or, or, you know, fewer moving parts. And, you know, if you've never used a headset, it's literally just the two lenses. And it's a split screen on your phone. And what we find was really surprising. For our audience at home, three and four were entirely new to VR, 75%. And that astounded me. I really, I thought everyone had experienced VR, but apparently I am in a little bubble in a university of advanced technology, so who knew? <laughs> now, in the actual live events, there was, uh, it was a slightly more familiar crowd, about uh, half were new. But still, you're coming to a virtual reality event and you've never used, half had never used virtual reality before, but they were willing to give it a go. And that was very encouraging too, again, of all age groups. But I wasn't prepared for the level of actual physical demonstration of how it worked. 
I, my poor team were trying to run the event and also show hundreds of people how to install or how to run or how to, to literally fit it in and where to click. And I wasn't prepared for that. I thought it was intuitive. And that's, of course, because I'm at a center for advanced technology <laughs> and very exposed to VR. I'd underestimated the new technology's newness. It felt intuitive, but it was anything but. So that was my second lesson. Just because I think this is as simple as it can be doesn't mean it's simple enough. So don't underestimate that when you're trying to tell a story a different way. Now, we got there, even though some people uh, unfortunately missed out on the experience because they didn't have a phone. So luckily, we actually had a big screen. So the library had asked, do you want to use the big projector? And I was like, well, the whole point was to free us from the projector. But thank God we took a stream from my phone and, sh and, and um, telecast it up there so that the audience could enjoy it because there was a significant fraction who didn't have a phone, who didn't understand that was the requirement for virtual reality. Now, the final lesson I learned, and the entire point for me on a personal level, was can I teach differently in virtual reality? And at some level, not really. It kind of worked. We were telling stories virtually, telling lessons, and in this picture, you can see we're all, everyone has their headsets on, right? So everyone is exploring the solar system. They could have any view of the solar system they want. They could go to any planet. They could have skipped that. They could have gone all the way to the edge of the universe. They could have seen the, the afterglow of the Big Bang, the cosmic microwave background. They could have seen the sun. They could have seen neutron stars. They could have seen black holes. No one did anything but follow me. <laughs> I narrated their exploration of the entire universe and no one raced ahead. And I was very disappointed in that because I thought I can give the audience the universe to play in. Where will they go? They sat waiting <laughs> for me. And even worse, by the way, by the end, this is later on, I just want you to note like, the number of faces that are not using the headsets anymore. <laughs> They're just looking at a TV. Again, after the State Library, we recognize that, oh, flip, we do need a projector just in case. But it's a, it's a brewery, so we had to wheel in a TV. Um, most of the people weren't even using the headsets by the end. So again, I was in love with this idea of a new technology allowing me to tell a story differently, to teach differently. But the user experience was different to what I'd hoped. So my failing, and I still don't know how, but I'm very interested in hearing from a panelist, is how to tell that story differently with this new medium. I just want to give a shout out, by the way. This was one of the hardest things I've ever done. <laughs> yeah, I create universes <laughs> on supercomputers. Mm -hmm. Trying to do, create the app, create the headsets, ship it all from you know, international distributors, um, do a live stream, Here's Alistair running our social feeds, trying to get people to log in. Um, we're taking multiple different views. We're switching between. Um, we made uh, uh, Mark Mars look like a, a DJ as he like tried to, to hassle, like switch between all these views. All of this ridiculous effort for what was supposed to free the audience from the requirements of a lecture theater to tell that story differently. I'm very proud of my team. I think they did an astounding job. Um, but I would say that, again, the, the, the level of technology we f find ourselves trapped in to use got in the way of the story. And that was a surprise to me because I thought I knew better than let technology lead me by the nose, but it absolutely wasn't. My final lesson, and this one I'll give for free. You can find a new audience with a new technology. But don't underestimate the barrier of that technology to that new audience. Thirdly, you do have to think differently about how you tell a story, and that's not something I've understood. But in my experience, the new story goes down easier when you have a beer with it. Thank you. <laughs> oh, wow.
Thank you, Alan. <laughs> yeah, most things go down easier if you have a beer with it, don't they? Um, a theatre director, an artist and filmmaker, and a science educator. You're all experimenting in different ways with your own practice or, or your pedagogy by trying this kind of immersion. Before you started, when you kind of just kind of grasped onto the idea of immersive experiences taking people somewhere else, when you're a VR virgin, let's say, what was in your head? Like, what did you actually think? Oh, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I really want to do. Like, what was the, the fantasy VR experience you were going to create? I think I underestimated, uh, um, I underestimated how powerful VR would, like, actually is. Um, like, I'd, I'd done gaming before and all that kind of stuff, and I think in my head I kind of just thought it was a new way of just, you know, playing a game or something like that. I thought you'd be very aware that you're in it. Definitely, I think with lower end um, VR headsets, it is like that there, there is that disconnect between the total immersion. But if you put on a proper headset like a Oculus Rift or HTC Vive and you go into that land, um, I think I was just genuinely astonished at how much I did believe I was in that environment um, because. Yeah, it, it, the way your brain can just be so convinced that you look around and you feel it and you believe that you're you're in there. Um, I, it actually surprised me in a positive way of just being like, oh my gosh, I can't believe we're here with tech right now. Like I yeah, and I'm so excited to see how it goes further with like developments with mm. CG and um, just where it's going to be even better if we can be having these created worlds, which still right now, I suppose, even in like film, if we see like animated characters, we, we know they are animated characters, but um, I think it's that just gets even better and better and better and we're able to interact in these VR worlds um, where you can walk around and be disconnected. Like, I'm so excited. I think it's going to be, um, yeah, it's definitely getting there so much more. And I think once they, the, what they're really hoping to do at the moment, um, so for the Oculus Rift or the HTC Vive, which I'm talking about, you have to be plugged into a really good computer. Mm -hmm. So when I was working for them, they, you know, gave me gave me one of these things. This is worth like twelve hundred dollars. And I was stoked. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna do all this like VR. And I can't play it. My headset went to my boyfriend, and I never saw him ever again because <laughs> he was trapped in his like computer land. Um, but like that's it. it. You have to have all of the necessary, mm -hmm. you know, com mm. technical, you know, equipment, which. For my parents to see my film, which I made, which I spent six months working on, they had to go to my boyfriend's house. And I was like, oh, babe, can we just <laughs> go inside for a second? Like, mm. you know, it's that accessibility thing, which I think is what is the, what I think is the problem right now. And once they do, be a, once we are at a stage where we do have the, the high-end headsets that don't need to be plugged into a computer, that's when I think it's going to be what everyone's kind of like waiting for, necessarily. Mm. I I reckon um, VR was exactly what I thought it would be. No, that's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, when, when Katrina and I were talking about it, like I imagined what it would be like to play Fallout 4 and um, how much I admire that game for its, for its writing. It's beautiful. There's mm -hmm. some really, really clever shit going on in there and it's well worth the effort that's mm -hmm. been put into it. And I'm excited about, um, you know, what Last of Us is going to... Um, mm -hmm be like but seriously like when I said to her <coughs> I want to make a, a short version of our show it's exactly what we did and it, it looks I mean I didn't imagine the studio at afters but um, maybe I, I, in, I, I inhabit um, spaces and think about them in those ways already mm. it was just having a camera that allowed me to have a full 360 degree view. Mm. Mm. Um, what does it bring specifically to a puppetry show though? Let's say, you know, the, the nature. Yeah, like, why does it mesh well for you? Like, it, you say it's exactly how you imagined it would be. I reckon be. part of me want, doesn't want to know. Mm. It's, it's, it's about being excited and stimulated by it and mm. it's about not questioning the magic. Mm -hmm. You know, and if and if I if, if I analysed it too much, it would lose its appeal. Mm. Um, it, you know, that that's part of. It's the in, intangible aspect of it. It's, mm. I am somewhere, but I'm not. But mm. I am. 
but I'm not. But you're not. <laughs> <laughs> but I am. But <laughs> And it's that's, an exact thought. It is that process of yeah, being like, you do I know I'm here, but I'm not here, but I am here. And yeah. like, just that the being aware. And when you do really get immersed in a story, you you generally forget where you are. And I get yeah, tears are falling down my face because I think I'm in Peru. And just that that strength to be able to transport people. Um, is but I think what, yeah. I think good storytelling is really really key. And I've yeah. I've since you know, relaxed a bit more and had a look at what other people are making. And there's some real shit out there. And, yeah. and sadly, it's the cowboys with the money that can afford the equipment that are going around going, oh, look at what we're doing, you know, we're so cool. And you go, actually, you're not. You're really boring and you're just wasting our time. Like, there's much better things like the clouds over sitter and, and, you know, the work that you've done. And that's far more important than knowing what it's like for a guy with a too much money to play. Oh, you know, like it just shits me. Just <laughs> I, think, I think what we are going on about with the whole storytelling is that um, when we walked, you know, walked in again, the best of the best, and they said, you know, these people with 20 years film experience, and they said, I want you to forget everything you know about film mm. because what we're making is experiences. And that was the difference that you are designing how somebody feels, not what they see, you design how they feel in that mm. space. Mm. So when you set up a camera, you think about, okay, I've got to get the height right. I've got, how does somebody want to feel in that space? Do they want to be sitting down? Are we lowering that? Like I do, and for directing people as well, it's massive. Cause like I said, mm. like they were waiting to be told what to do. So for us, things like, um, I have a motorbike go past in a scene and naturally, you hear a motorbike going around your ears, you, you turn, and then there's information standing there because it's really hard to know where somebody's going to be looking when they're in a scene and like, oh that's, oh, that's pretty. And there's like this giant murder scene going on over there. And you're like, oh, cool, yeah. And you've missed it. And um, so with designing these stories and these experiences, the whole time you have to be thinking about how you are going to capture that direction. And while you can say that you want somebody to experience 360 space, awesome, you mm. need to give them time to take in that environment yeah. and then have something amazing mm. happening. Because, um, yeah, it, it was like just even watching it during our edit, like each of my editors would have an entirely different experience of when we were watching what they were looking at. And they were like, no, you meant to be looking over there. But they don't know that. Um, and so you'd have to drop audio cues in or you'd have to cut it faster or get a kid walking past and be like, hey, you know. And so just little cues like that um, and just having that whole element of if you're, you're creating experiences. And when we set up for a shoot, I always stand exactly where the camera is and I think about how I feel and it's that, okay, what like is something small? Are we inside? Are we outside? What's the lighting? Um, yeah, it's, it's entirely but different. But don't, don't you reckon also that it's, it's to pick up on what you were saying before, maybe all those people would have gone off on lots of different tangents if you had to stop talking. Yeah, if, that, if you that hadn't have me, been, yeah. if they hadn't have been, you know, devoted to you and listening to you, if you had have inducted them in a way to say, what we're about to do is something that's never been done mm. before. You are all potentially new explorers. We don't know where you're going to go. Off you go. Yeah, so that's, that's interesting uh, you raise it because that's actually what the new grant says. Um, <laughs> and, and it was because we tried to mar the old way of storytelling with the new technology that we didn't realise the benefits of the new technology. Not, I mean, it's still cool, right? Yeah. And I suspect that if... I, I just don't know, am I going to get an audience to come into a space and they get told that, yeah, the talk is your journey, you get to do it, I'll see you in 50, and, and just walk out on them. What would they do? Would they lose it? I don't know. I'm interested to find out. I don't know if yeah. National Science Week is willing to pay to find <laughs> out, but we'll see. Um, and that, so I think that, um, getting back to, to the original question about, I thought the power of the technology would be so overwhelming that it would transform the experience without me having to personally change. As a, as a lecturer, oh. as an educator. And that's simply not true. And, and I think it's, it's, as you say, we do need to allow the audience permission or, or to empower them to go on that journey themselves. And possibly it is as, as simple as, see you later, 
yeah. going to be off stage. And that, that's yeah. when it changes the dynamic. But so, audio is a really key thing to kind mm. of um, signpost and to mm. flag things mm. that are about to happen if there's things that you want people to experience. I just want to pick up on that a little bit. So when Jesse's talking about designing for immersion, what you're saying is that you need to design outside the experience itself almost. You need to be prepared to create the, you know, sort of the nose to tail of an immersive experience the instant they walk in the door if you're going to do something in a public setting. Yeah, if you want to do something yeah. new, then every, from, from start yeah. to end, and maybe even just the, 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 the emails, the way mm. you're preparing them before they even arrive, mm. you want to flag that this is going to be new. Mm. Um, I, but I, I really love your ideas of the audio drops, and I think that's, that's key, and that's one of the things that struck me about the failure so far, I think, of, of VR films to really take off, and that's because we're still doing it in the old fashion where I know where I want you to look, and I'm the director, and you're going to look there, and this is the story. But in VR, you just wandered off. You missed that bit. Oh, and yeah. how do you design a world that will still allow the, the viewer to get the experience that you, as the storyteller, want, but without forcing them, literally holding their head to move them around? And you do it by nudges, right? We just had the behavioral uh, economics Nobel Prize awarded for nudge behavior. Yeah. It's those simple yeah. cues that you don't realize you're being told to do something. What I was thinking is funny when you're saying that. I am curious to see what somebody's experience would have been like if instead of a Google Cardboard, they had the Rift. Mm. I w I'm I curious because with like I, I even find cardboards difficult because it, it, typically you're like okay you put in the camera and you do this. I was just saying before, so um, QT up in Brisbane, I worked for them and they um do they did the exact same, made all these Google cardboards, spent thousands, made thousands, and these kids are walking around like oh this is so cool, this is amazing. There's no phone in it. <laughs> like, like, like they, they just thought this was fun in itself. And so that, like, um, yeah, so I think like unless you were directly, if I gave this to my mom, she'd have no idea what to do with mm -hmm. it. Um, and so I think just, again, making everything as easy as possible is a great way with like getting people ready for that kind of step. But I'd be really curious to see whether they felt more free to explore. So we, we demoed this up at, uh, at Swinburne with the, um, with the Vive uh, mm -hmm. set up. And we actually, and the cable is a nightmare, by the way. Yeah. It completely breaks oh, yeah. you, drops you out of experience. You're literally, your head is being, you're being tugged back. It's an umbilical cord to the back I'm of your so head. I'm so ready for cordless. Yeah, I'm sorry. oh, I know, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> oh, data rates, that's a nightmare. <laughs> Anyways, uh, but, but the cord, the easy solution is you just, you just pull it up and you have a little clothes for it or, you know, some sort of a little um, peg it just loops over on the roof so they don't feel the weight anymore, and that's very freeing. Now, not every home's gonna, you know, knock up <laughs> sort of hole or whatever into the roof, but, um, but that was enough to get the immersion, and what we find was uh, the user experience was a truly incredible when you feel that you are floating in space and there is the sun in front of you, or there's a galaxy forming in front, and because it's more powerful, one of the things I couldn't do was show my simulated universes yeah. on the app, which broke my heart a little bit. Yeah. That's <laughs> part of the reason I wanted to do it, because I wanted to be in one of my universes. Yeah. Mm. Not this universe this sucks. Mm. And, uh, and unfortunately, um, it's only on the vibe you can do that. But, but to see <clears throat> something spin up in front of you and to reveal the galaxy, that's cool. Mm. That is a genuinely moving, affecting moment. Mm, mm, mm. What I would love to then do is say, here are the force vectors. Here is the spin. This is the bit of physics. Now you're getting to understand rotational mechanics because you're seeing it and seeing is believing in it. And it just, in, it becomes so much easier to learn quite challenging physics concepts when you can see them. And that's not something you can easily do in the lab. Certainly, you don't get to do it for an audience of 300. And that's really where I want to take this. I still have my lecture theater. But everyone gets to be in the experiment. And that will be the moment that I think we can really push education in VR. Have you played that VR game where you like are in a spaceship flying through the galaxy? I can't remember the name of it right now. So pretty much everything. Star Wars? No, no, no. It's yeah. like it's amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry if I was like I about to like that. wreck your world, but they made pretty much exactly what you're talking Sick. about. Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's easy. Sorry. Um, and it's this VR game, um, and you and it's 
made by real data, I don't know who made it, but a real true simulation of the entire universe made with real data. And um, yeah, you go on a spaceship and I don't know, there's like missions and stuff. But I wasn't really interested in that, but the fact that I could sit in a spaceship and fly around Saturn and look at, and it's, it's all real, like it's all true, real generated. Um, and me just as a viewer, not looking at it at a science level, was like, wow, this is stunning. It's a stunning experience. Um, and so I feel like something like that, where you look around and you know these planets are flying, everything's great. If you could then have that element of science on top of that, definitely. And I feel like yeah, just going down that path of using um, those really high power, you need a really strong system to run that. Um, but yeah, if we merge all that stuff together of education of engaging education, that, that's what I was doing. The sign language thing was about how can we make education something super fun or super mm. immersive and that's what I think VR does it makes it enjoyable or interesting or cool just in itself and then if we can apply the learning we actually want at the same time bundle it up I'm mean, gonna get you the name of it you're gonna love this game <laughs> yeah, I can't wait love or hate it like yeah. I <laughs> but is, it, is it a better return then like you watch it once but then you watch it twice once you get sucked in and then you find out the yeah. shit and then you go back in and go oh that's what it is it's like watching Westworld twice <laughs> I think it seems like a good time to talk about some other examples mm. of, um, that I've collected together which I think are about trying to do exactly what tonight's event said, opening portals onto worlds that we could never physically inhabit and expanding the realms of human experience. So we've collected a, f a few together and um, I thought we could have a chat about them because mm -hmm. it's interesting given your experience. So since we've got an astrophysicist here, let's start with Mars. Um, Mars 2030 is a Mars experience for Oculus and Vive, developed in consultation with NASA for education and outreach. It's got 20 kilometres of player accessible topography that is accurate and rendered in 8K. So we've got a bit of a, a flatty trailer oh, here. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone tried this out uh, in the audience tonight? Or, yeah? Well, um, yeah, so this VR experience is meant to show what strolling around Mars will be like in 2030, around the time that NASA plans to get there. So the spaceship, the habitat and the space suits are all based on NASA's concepts with the highest regard for scientific accuracy. So, Scott, you're a master of suspending disbelief. <laughs> Is realism really going to be that important to immersive technology, in your opinion? Is something like this? Well, I have it on good authority that that's not what Mars looks like. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and which authority would that be? <laughs> that I, I got really hardcore geek earlier when we were looking, and I was like, that's not the sunset you would get on Mars. <laughs> uh, it actually, sunsets are blue and midday is red. Mm. It scatters light the opposite way to Earth. But I think the important point about disbelief, if you were to see a blue sunset, that would just break you out of the experience. You would mm. not buy it. Even though that was but, really the way it is. Mm. I suspect it would break. But experience. what happened with Avatar, where everybody just so wanted to believe it that they actually developed a depression over the fact that they couldn't go there. <laughs> oh, yeah. some blue face paint but on they, there, that's, like. that's disbelief, isn't that? That's such total suspension. That's like, this is a place that I really want to go to and film how James Cameron has made it possible and, and now I to so believe that it's possible that now I've got to go see a psychiatrist. That wasn't real. That's the difference, right? They had strived for mm. beauty and a heavenly world. By going down the reality path, they make Mars look really crappy. <laughs> like, well, I don't really want to go there, right? It looks dry and dead. <laughs> but it's actually, of course, it's striking and it's beautiful and it's very... Um, you know, as a scientist, I, I adore the, the fascination I have on the realism, but um, just as I bagged them up for not having the right sunsets, um, I do wonder if the, if what they're trying to do is aspirational, educational, then I think that's 
yeah. the right way to go. And if we can hang out with orangutans in, in Borneo, then I'll, I'll suspend my disbelief as much as possible. <laughs> Mm. But do Which you think it lot. needs to be hyper-realistic in order to do no, that? I no, I don't think so at all. I think we live in a world where everything is possible and, yeah. you know, for definitely when I said that puppetry is the new black, it was because, you know, shows like um, Lion King and uh, War Horse and even um, King Kong here meant that the greater population sort of had a greater, a better appreciation of what puppetry could be. Mm. And so you know, a horse doesn't have to be real on stage. It can, you can see through it, and, mm. but you can still be brought, dragged into mm. the emotional quality mm. of it. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think people underestimate their imaginations and mm. they, as children are the ones who actually know how to do it, you work that stuff much better than adults because adults are more worried about their mortgages and, and you know whether they get their tax done in time and <laughs> where's the like tax time? Weeks left, right? <laughs> like, <Where's> yeah. <laughs> I'm really worried about my tax. At the moment. Is it a useful way to understand what's happening in space? I mean, obviously, they've made that decision. Yeah. So I think the. So if you've not seen this, has anyone done the on Steam destinations? Mm. There was an experience where you could. Yeah. I mean, for me, that's even better because mm. that's the. Um, the images from Curiosity rover and, and the actual rover on Mars. It's like, oh, it's right there. Oh, that's pretty neat. Yeah. And even better is as you begin to look around from the vantage point of you as the geologist, Marsologist, whatever, you can see there's a fossilized riverbed. Yeah. Like you don't need a sketchy picture that someone like me is then on you know, ABC or whatever trying to explain to you. Um, you can see that that's clearly an ancient riverbed. Yeah. And it's because you've been able to get these images from Curiosity super accurate, stitched together beautifully, and then you, as the explorer, get that experience and, and that learning opportunity. So I think you have a place for hyper-realistic imagery when you want to do that kind of a lesson. But I don't think yeah. it's necessary to go to that degree if, if what you just want is perhaps the physics lesson, because that is more conceptual. Mm. And it would be interesting, in fact, in that movie, the better learning is actually the sunset and, and midday sky than perhaps the topology, beautiful as it is, mm. um, unless you could chip away at the surface. If you could reach out tactile style yeah. and chip a bit of the, uh, yeah. that yeah. Mars, and then you're real, I mean, then you've got to be real, and then the reality really pays the dividends. Mm. Otherwise, I suspect you might be able to just go, uh, here's what you think you're seeing and here's what it would really look like and change the sky and just break the person's experience that way. Mm. Don't hang up on the fact that you've, you've done that massive transformation because actually the fun learning is that big reveal. Um, but yeah, I think, I think Hyperreal is, is great and gorgeous and I love mm. it and obviously I have top end everything at the, at the uni, but I suspect that it's the suspension of disbelief works so well even on this smartphone app the user experience people made it real mm. people got vertigo mm. off their phone i mean it's incredible mm. to me but just sorry just adding on from that so i feel like yeah you get bored unless you either have a story or you have interaction and so with vr games and that whole interactive play yeah if you can pick up rocks and throw them and like run around like that's gonna be great mm. fun um, NASA just did a 360, a real 360 video stream of um, like the, the spacewalk. Uh, oh, the cosmonauts! Right? Holy uh, hell! And, and so, like a person, you know, like, like real footage of somebody fly, floating out in space and stuff. Mm. Which I unfortunately just looked at on a laptop and 360. I really do want to do it in a headset. Um, but just looking at it on a computer, it, it kind of like yes, it was it was stunning. It was real. I knew this was actually exactly happening. And I was kind of like, and then what? Yeah. And it was oh. like, how am I here being like, and then what? Like, I, I wanted, I feel like the fact that we have this incredible technology, this incredible ability to show anything mm. we want to, but unless there's that emotional hook or that sense of like, yeah. if I was floating in space and then I could wiggle my hands as well, then yeah, that'd be great fun. But it's just, I don't know. It was yeah. like, it lacked, it was stunning. Did you wait till the end? Cause you see no, them, I, oh my uh, God, I, they I, threw a satellite. Oh, like that's how they launched <laughs> yeah. into orbit. They're literally oh. like hanging outside the space station. Get 
what looks like an old Sputnik. It was, it was sort of celebration uh, 56 years since Sputnik. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye. It's like, Bye. Thanks. <laughs> I've never seen that. Are you kidding me? Because usually my camera's pointed somewhere else. I was like, oh my god. Recently but, this year they put a camera on top of a, a rocket and shot it up. Mm. Have you seen that? No. And you, and when you're like you're on top of the rocket looking down at the ground, it's shot somewhere in another part of the world, and um, <laughs> and you pull G's. Mm. Like you, the rocket takes off and you physically you feel yeah. it in your body, like you're being pulled down, like you can feel it and you know that it's not real. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's more of your that's cool. mind makes it real. <laughs> <laughs> I've got um, a very good Oh, not too many loves for the Matrix yeah. reference. Okay, interesting. <laughs> um, I thought I'm this would be the audience who so loves the Matrix, right? All right. I'm glad you mentioned interactivity because I was going to talk about the blue next, um, which is a bit of a, an exception in that it has no gameplay elements, but it's still one of the most popular VR experiences on the Vive. It's a, an underwater experience by Wii VR for Vive where you encounter deep sea creatures. It ended up becoming a museum experience at the LA Natural History Museum, but it's, it's, pretty, um, it's pretty much that. So if you want to... I think uh, they're going to drive it in the uh, bio box. <laughs> Is this the one with the whale? Yeah, mm. it's the one with the whale. Spoilers. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to find the whale. Yeah. So it's um, it's, there's, it's actually got three separate experiences on this one. There's one where you're on a, a reef and there's lots of jellyfish coming past. There's one where you go down into the cave. Into a cave, yeah, and. Um, and then there's this one. Here. It's just this one here. So you can actually um, walk around. It's room scale, so you can walk around uh, a little in this, but there's very little to do other than to look. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, it does. It has lovely and, sound. But yeah. I, I've seen this a few times, and it it yeah. dates really quickly. Yeah. I feel... Yeah. As in you don't watch it again? You don't watch well, it again? I've, after the first time of going, wow, mm. when I went back the second time, mm. it was like, oh. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whales over it. <laughs> well, I, I, think, um, I think that's quite interesting, actually, because what's it for is quite a good, yeah. a good question. To I mean, it's a short experience. Uh, very little happens to you in the experience. But does it does it have value in taking you to a, a portal that you can't? Yeah, underwater. Yeah. I actually showed it to a um, ten year old today, and um, she'd never it. she'd never been snorkeling before, um, hadn't actually been snorkeling, and neither had her mother, and they both watched it, and they're off, you know, booking snorkeling. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. This snorkeling is how we get holidays. Great Bay Area yeah, like yeah, and for them it was just so. Otherly, and I was, yeah. I'm kind of interested, I suppose, also in the the educative potential of just seeing things, yeah. not doing anything. We tend to get very, I don't know. So the, that was I mean, mm. computer generated. Um, so a friend of mine, one of the other VR for Good people, um, mm. she did an underwater shoot, um, and she it was all about like the fact, obviously, we're like wrecking all the reefs and stuff, um, and, but. It was really cool to see the fact that we can get these these 360 cameras underwater and I, like, I grew up in the Torres Straits, I went diving every single day of my life, but the fact for someone who ha who hasn't and um, you know that that is a novelty experience, it was really mm. cool. To, and when you when you are in a headset and you think you're underwater, your body thinks you're underwater as well. Like mm. it's that whole just tricking the psychology and um, it's a really calming, interesting experience. Vice versa to that, there's um, another experience where you're standing, you're looking at this beautiful place and sharks are swimming underneath you and you know, you're standing in a bedroom and I was so on edge, I wanted to like, pick up my feet because there's these giant white sharks underneath me. Mm -hmm. um, and having that just ability of just like completely tricking your brain into thinking, like having a fear or having a reaction or an experience. Um, yeah, and like, I mean, going Be shark, like I don't have to leave my room and I think there's a shark underneath me. Um, we're gonna have a lot of like psychological issues in the next 30 years. Well, <laughs> <it's quite laughs> yeah, I, th I think that's actually an interesting point. We talk about um, this sort of user experience making it real. Yeah. And it's, you know, when it's about space, that's inspiring and wonderful and it truly is wondrous. And, and the same too with the deep diving. 
But I wondered, we make it so real, do we actually end up scarring people, right? Do people freak out that badly? And if you have a total experience, um, I can't believe I'm, I'm going to maybe say this, but it really sounds like something from the Daily Mail back in, in the 90s about games, but are you desensitizing a population now when perhaps you, know, you go from zombie hunts in VR to um, GTA style, are you going to eventually get to the point where you just desensitize? Does it become that real? But because if it's it is triggering different... people to go and actually have the Not real that. experience, I... that's... Oh, well, shit. Well, in that case, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's terrible if it's GTA. Yeah, yeah. Let's not do that. <laughs> Sorry, if you ever have not played Grand Theft Auto, <laughs> uh, yeah, you sure. don't want a lot of people thinking that's what they want to do in their lives, right? It's, it's pretty violent. Pretty, I mean, just going on what you guys are mentioning, um, virtual therapy, um, virtual reality therapies, have anyone looked into that much? Um, yeah. So what they're using now is it as, like, for, for medical issues um, to overcome things. And I watched a video the other day of what you're saying about desensitizing. And it was a man who had... Um, PTSD, no. he'd been to war, um, and you know, he was constantly, if he would go to the shopping center, sounds would go, like, I, I check, mm. you know, you, just the PTSD um, responses, and he was, he couldn't leave his house because he was so scared of all these noises, and so what they did was they put him in um, a VR experience of him being in a tank, you know, he's going along, and there are bombs going off, and there's that sound, and it's to to make him desensitized to that environment that he'd been used to, but he then had like, ownership of it. And I think they developed, this game was made by um, like professors at a university and they were working on it, but just the ability in that they studied him afterwards and he had such a positive result from being desensitized to this experience of where his brain thought he was there, but he knew he wasn't there, but he was there, but he was safe. Um, and then he was able to, you know, get back into regular society and, you know, be able to go to the shops without having that fear because he had become used to and desensitized to it. So I think it's like really interesting space um, if you are looking at it. Um, yeah, virtual reality therapies, they're doing some crazy stuff at the moment uh, and we are seeing really positive results. So I think the more that gets like experimented with and where they go of what we can do if you trick the brain, like um, vertigo, fear of heights, like, They've had massive, massive breakthroughs with that. Like people are standing on the ground, but they think they're standing on top of a skyscraper. And that fear that people have like measured, people's heart rates are flying through the roof. Like they think they're about to jump off a skyscraper. And um, then just the, through the therapy that they do each little while and stuff, it's that whole desensitizing and then being adjusted to it. So I think it's gonna be pretty cool to see how it's going to be used as an actual you know, medical assistance in the future. Um, I was going to talk a little bit more about um, things like uh, haptics and what happens when you bring yeah. like physical sensations into the VR experience. But I'm aware we've actually only got a few minutes left and I, I was told to leave time for questions. So, Haptics suck, yeah, don't uh, worry. Yeah, not good yet, right? um, do, do people have questions? Hmm? Five minutes? Yeah, all right. Let's unless, go. unless the first let's, audience question was about haptics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's jump, um, let's jump yeah. forward to tree. Um, uh, Doug, so basically one of the most exciting possibilities for future immersive experiences is the possibility that you can gauge all the sensors. Um, tree VR is a, a virtual experience that transforms you into a rainforest tree. With your arms as branches and the body as the trunk, you experience the tree's growth from a seedling into its fullest form and witness its fate firsthand. So the filmmakers work with MIT labs to include a, a haptic feedback component, but there's a little visual kind of thing of you turning into a seed, uh, growing up through the earth. So the haptics providing that sense of resistance? So uh, if I can talk over the top, so they, they did this as part of their research into body ownership illusion and VR. And um, there's a, a so this is you being born <laughs> as a tree. Oh, thank you. Oh. <laughs> 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 oh. So you can feel the rain? So yeah, yeah, you can. So they basically, I'll tell you the technical details in a second, but they're kind of like these 
haptic sleeves that you put on and then you stood on a, a, a platform that had vibration uh, coming through it. It's and covered then, in grass as well. It yeah. was beautiful. Like they had a whole set like stage design as well. And so you like have the grass and then you have haptics. It's yeah, they, they stage it really beautifully. Do you want to um, explain it having um, uh, experienced the, it? The thing that I, I really think is cool about this is like that whole element of scale. Um, and like we was mentioning before, if you keep a camera low, like you think you're a child. And so the fact that they've tricked the brain into thinking you're growing by starting small and that having that whole scale change is just really, really cool. Um, there's some cool stuff with bees and you think you're a bee is flying around and stuff. But with, yeah, with Tree, I think it was scales or some haptics. It's a funny one because um, everybody's body shapes are different. And so when you get, you know, they've obviously made it for a generic thing, but you want it to be right on your heart or right on your throat or right on your key points. Whereas like the suits that I've tried on, um, they're all, you know, they're not perfect. And if you want, if someone's, you know, hitting here and the heart's over here, it just doesn't, it's, it's just not yet right, perfect. And you have things where they all like squeeze you a bit. So you feel as if, you know, that, that scary tightness. Um, and I think it's awesome that people are experimenting with it. I think it's going to go places mm. definitely right now. It's, for, for mm. me, it wasn't the experience. It, it detracted from the experience for me. Mm. I, was, I was taken out of the immersion because I was aware that that wasn't my heartbeat pumping because it was you know, too high or too low and yeah, not the right thing. So I think once we do evolve to it, it could be mm. cool. But right now, I think it's detracting from the immersion, unfortunately. Mm. Um, they also did things like put um, fans to make yeah. a breeze and mm. heat to, so you could feel a forest fire coming. and that sort of thing, to put you in the position where you felt like you were experiencing the life of the tree. That's awesome. So, just... They won uh, lots of awards. Yeah. Very oh, cool. yeah. Does anyone have any um, questions? Um, really interesting what you're saying, but quite frankly, what I've heard tonight is exactly what I've read about the beginning of cinema, mm -hmm. in that people really believed what they saw on the screen and uh, Dr. Duffy might interest you to know that I think, especially in the 30s, filmmakers had this idea that they were going to transform education with cinema. Yeah. Didn't really happen, but really all the things you're saying. So, for example, if you want to tell a story with this medium, because it's just a different medium, that's what, then you're going to have to come up with a grammar, which is what cinema, what saves cinema. Um, by the teens, they were not going well. The audience was dropping off. So they, by then they'd come up with a grammar and they were able to tell a really good story. And uh, of course, the, the first big one was Birth of a Nation. But it would be interesting if you look back at what the problems they had and how they looked at it and solved it, um, it might help you. Uh, change what you're doing. Well, look, I might, I might just one-up your historical reference there. <laughs> uh, a, a learned uh, scholar, a friend of mine, Margaret, who's, I'm shamelessly stealing her words now, um, pointed out in the 1400s, the new painting of perspective changed our experience and was written about in the time of mm. bringing the people into the world. And that's a wonderful example that none of this is new in that sense so maybe we can learn from mm. how those new techniques were adopted and made real uh, to that audience or successful to that audience i actually think theater i think you've I, I, the way you started with that comment that because you were used to moving in a space it wasn't a static experience mm. to, as a passive experience you already were thinking in the right way for a user experience where you do walk through that theater stage. When you do storyboards for a 360 film, um, it's like, obviously, in typical, you do a storyboard, it's a square, you draw the shot. Instead, we, we have a circle, and there's a person in the middle of the circle, and then you storyboard like around what's happening in that circle. And yeah, it's just, it's, it's that different way of theater in the round. Like you're designing around the, where the viewer is, but you also have to be careful that if you are trying to tell a story that you know not everything's happening around everything at the same time at all the time if you want somebody to know about this one thing mm. because they can't take in all this information we can take in this much information mm. at one time 
um, and then move around or with it. So yeah, it's just a really interesting way of like new new storyboarding, new moving, like that whole element mm. of this is just a new media. It's how we use it and evolve it to fit with everything else. I think. Um. Thank you for mentioning me, Ellen. Um, <laughs> I've been smart of her time, by the way. <laughs> Learned and scholar. <laughs> I've been writing about VR for 30 years. And I wanted to raise a question about this utopian conception of what it can do. Because I'll just tell you a brief story about VR. So you, you mentioned, Jesse, that they're using VR for medical rehab and you know rehab of people with post-traumatic stress syndrome with, um, from war. There's a lab in, at USC in LA that does that sort of work. I visited that lab um, 15 years ago, and before they were doing medical rehab, what they were doing was using VR to actually train people to go and be soldiers in Iraq. And so I just want to raise the issue that nobody's really mentioned, or Alan referred to it briefly. 99% of what's being done with VR is about war, things like Grand Theft Auto. People are beginning to write about the fact that there is a relationship between VR and the fact that people are driving cars into pedestrians. That, that so many of the people, who guys who grow up with all these VR games, um, are going out and shooting people. So I think we need to be aware that like all medias, it's got utopian potential, but it's also got dystopian potential. Yeah. Absolutely, I think that's with, um, again, like even video games or whatever, even films, if somebody's showing someone shooting a million people in a, in a film, is that, is that as strong as a 360 experience? Or is the VR headset that extra step where someone does feel that? And yeah, yeah I think I mean, everything can be used for good or can be used for bad. Um, and. Hopefully, I think it's just creators choosing to create for good, not necessarily bad, but yeah, was was always something which is very messy. Um, I was yeah approached to make something for Australian Defence Force, and it was just something I wasn't really keen on doing. I was approached about doing something for um, coal rigs, like a training thing for coal rigs, so they don't have to go out. And again, it wasn't something that I really wanted to be a part of. And um, yeah, so I think it's just that it's like, choosing where creators decide to create. Um, but I think there's always going to be good and bad in everything, unfortunately. I think, yeah, I think you just pay attention to the age restrictions. I think maybe we need that conversation again as mm. a society. It feels like we don't take them seriously, 18s and 15s or whatever the rating schemes are, uh, depending on your country. Um, and, it was, and it was pretty bad when I saw um, my, actually, one of my younger sisters, she was playing a game and Call of Duty, and she was so much better at just wiping out hundreds of people than I've ever been in this game. And it was kind of sad because she was seven. And I was thinking, God damn, how much have you played this? You know? And, and she's turned into one of the worst people I've ever known. <laughs> she's a lawyer. <laughs> just Becky, if you're watching. But, Look, I, I do take it very seriously, and I, and I think the age restrictions really need to be applied in virtual reality because we don't know what it does as a new immersive experience. That is it that much more? I, my emotional experiences in VR have been so much stronger than anything I've experienced before. Now, whether that's another year from now, I'm going to be completely desensitized to it, it'll just be fine like a film. I don't know, and I suspect it won't. I suspect it is going to always be that little bit more involving. And, and we do need more research, to be honest, on this. And I think that seems like a good place to end. Oh, what a diner? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> more research. More Said research. the scientist, what yes, a surprise. Please, friends, funding. Yeah, funding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you want to phone yeah. me, I would say we are actually about to do that. Oh. Bit of research um, in Baby Lab in Swinburne. We're actually going to try to figure out, do people or do, do young uh, uh, adults or, and even and primary and below, do they learn through VR in a different way or in a better way? And I'll be in touch to hear more about that because <laughs> that's very interesting to us as well. I'd like to ask you all to give a big um, round of applause for our panel this evening. Scott Wright, Jesse Hughes and Alan Duffy. <laughs> 
sure you I'm sure you'll agree it's been a fascinating conversation. We could probably go for another two hours. But um, you can find links to their work on the ACNE website. And um, yeah, thanks very much. Have a good evening. Thank you.